rather sober interlude, the kind of light session we were supposed to have seems completely inappropriate. Uh, so I will, I will apologize in advance of what the organizers wanted me to talk about was the perils of being an educated politician, that their topic, not mine. And talking about that, I felt the only way to do it uh, was as informally and, and, um, and, and I hope humorously as possible, except that now, having just watched all of that, perhaps we need cheering up all the more. I did want to say, though, that um, the uh, idea is not to inflict a long speech on you. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my experiences in politics, but the more interesting thing, I think, would be to respond to, to your question, see what's on your mind. So let's have an interaction afterwards in the time that remains, and we'll, we're supposed to wrap up at 6 when we actually were uh, supposed to start at 5.30, but I'll go on till about 10 past so we can have a chance to... Uh, use the time that was intended to be there between us. So what is being, what does the topic actually mean? I was wondering, you know, the perils of being an educated politician. So there's a, clearly a perception that there are perils. And I suppose if one were to look at my experience um, over the last 10 and a half, almost 11 years now, in elected office, you can get a taste of some of those perils. Um, I came into politics, uh, I suppose, in rather unusual circumstances, in that unlike pretty much everybody else in the business, I hadn't spent a lifetime in politics. Almost every other Indian politician either hails from a political family, which I don't, or has uh, very strong political antecedents, which I don't, or has been a student activist risen up the ranks and worked in a political party all his or her political life, which also I don't. So I came in really, um, I think, on, on a whim by the Congress party leadership that thought that I might have something to contribute, given the visibility and attention that my unsuccessful run for Secretary General of the UN had had, not to mention, of course, um, that there were still some people, it was assumed, who read my books and, and, and thought that I might be a, a different sort of voice for what they were thinking about. In any case, I, I, I uh, had no idea what I was getting into. I very cheerfully said I was happy to contest and then uh, went through quite an extraordinary reception. My own party members burned my effigy upon my getting the nomination because they were supporting um, the, the person who'd lost the two previous attempts. He was, felt he deserved a third turn. Uh, there were, there were um, various sort of attempts to disown me. Um, there was the point made, not unreasonably, who is this fellow to think he can represent us? He doesn't know our place. He's used to working in air-conditioned offices in three-piece suits. Can he even speak our language properly? What's the point? How can we have this person there? Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it was a challenge from the very start to actually be considered a legitimately acceptable candidate, and that too in a seat that had been held on the two previous occasions uh, by the Communist Party of India. So I thought I would refute all this in the only way possible, which is to do everything that was asked of me by the party, to do so attired simply in local attire, uh, speaking uh, Perhaps a rather rudimentary Malayalam, but nonetheless one picked up on holidays to my ancestral homes in Kerala, uh, which therefore was not, was far from faultless, but was not, not inexistent. Uh, and then, um, and just go out there in the hottest month of the year, the hottest times of the day, talking to people and explaining to them that um, I hope to give them voice. And of course, the, the um, attacks on me about my inadequate Malayalam were actually the simplest to refute because I simply said to them in Malayalam after listening and talking to people for a while that as you can see I have enough Malayalam to understand your needs and your aspirations and what's more important in Delhi I have the Hindi and English to give voice to them in Parliament. Um, all our alternative colleagues who speak Shud Malayalam with you here are not going to be able to be half as effective as me in Delhi. That, that argument worked and I ended up winning with a record majority uh, for the first time. Uh, that's actually when the troubles got worse. <laughs> I found that uh, <coughs> every single thing I said became um, uh, an issue of controversy uh, in our media. I think some of it 
quite deliberately motivated malicious, but I was a babe in the woods, completely unprepared for this. On my visits from the UN or on my visits to India, from my living abroad, but to talk about my books or my writing or the UN work, I'd always been treated to an excessively friendly, respectful, and deferential press. So I got an overdose of the opposite in my very first year in office. And literally anything I said, you probably, some of you may even remember the various controversies whipped up over anything, any expression I used. If I said that Saudi Arabia could be a useful interlocutor with us, that was immediately created into a controversy alleging that I had said Saudi Arabia should be an intermediary between us and Pakistan, which of course is not India's foreign policy and is not something that I had said, but that became a controversy. The same thing happened. Other, the most notorious one of the lot was when um, I was asked by a journalist, a BJP-leaning leaning journalist on Twitter, when the government announced a, an austerity drive, he said, Mr. Minister, will you travel cattle class? Now, I had been living in the States where cattle class is a very routine expression, been around for 30 years. It is nothing insulting to people. It's an expression that actually insults the airlines for herding us into economy class like cattle. And since he used the expression, I assumed everyone knew it. So I replied, yes, I'll travel in cattle class out of solidarity with all our holy cows. Now, this may not be terribly funny, but I issued the tweet, got on a plane, went off uh, on a visit to Liberia and Africa, and I had to go uh, to Brussels, change aircraft there, fly to Accra, change aircraft there, fly to Liberia, and all of these intermediate points uh, I didn't have. Uh, access to, into, to any social media, anything. It's only when I got to Liberia, 23 hours after I left uh, Delhi, that I was getting all these panicky calls from Delhi saying that the proverbial dung had hit the proverbial fan, and that uh, there were calls for my resignation for having insulted economy class travelers. Uh, I, I was in a state of disbelief that such a thing could actually happen until I, I got reports that my own party spokespeople were denouncing me. Uh, and, and in these circumstances, obviously, I had no, no choice but to call the party leadership and say, are you serious? I mean, doesn't anyone understand what this is all about? And it took, finally, after four days of front-page controversy, the prime minister, no less, to say to journalists, baying for my blood, for God's sake, it was only a joke. I mean, this went on for several months, and one thing after another, it was very clear that my Agni Pariksha in my first term in office was to discover how unwelcome uh, intruders were into the closed circle of Indian politics. Um, and many, many controversies later that I won't bore you with, I actually did step down uh, as, as a minister. And that turned out in many ways to be a blessing, because I'd been an extremely active minister in the foreign ministry. I, don't, I think in all fairness, I was traveling over 20 days, um, uh, you know, every month uh, in order for us to be able to show the, the Indian flag in countries where no minister had traveled before. I became the first foreign, minister, uh, foreign ministry person from any country to get to Haiti after the earthquake, because I happened to be on a tour in Latin America for the government. When the earthquake happened, we had soldiers there, so I volunteered to go, I was able to pay respects uh, uh, to the dead, to, to commiserate the survivors. Uh, it was a great experience, but all that sort of thing was taking a severe toll back home, because not only was I being attacked um, just for being me, but in the meantime, the talk was rumbling in the constituency, what's the point of having an MP who's never here? So having resigned, I was able to devote myself uh, to, um, to my constituency, and that's where perhaps both the good and the bad happened. The good is that I, I became um, simply by doing it well and doing it conscientiously, a rather, uh, rather successful constituency MP, I was able to deliver results, a number of pending things that hadn't been, hadn't been accomplished before uh, by my distinguished predecessors. Um, but the bad thing, of course, and this is where the other peril of being an educated politician came, was that there was absolutely no uh, intellectual satisfaction in the bulk of the things one is required to do. Um, People don't understand, frankly, how hard MPs have to work. At least Kerala MPs, where the voters are knowledgeable, they know their rights, and they're very demanding. Uh, and, and what I found was that um, 
95% of what people come and ask an MP to do for them are things that in any Western democracy, no MP or, or senator or congressman would do because they'd be considered unethical. People come to you saying, uh, get my son a job, you know, uh, arrange a transfer for my daughter, uh, my son is posted in Nagaland and Kashmir and so on, we want him in Kerala, uh, etc., etc., et or we've taken this loan, we can't afford to pay it back, talk to the bank and get us either delayed terms or reduce the interest or cancel the interest. I mean, it's all these personal favors one after the other, and MPs are judged by their ability to deliver these personal favors to people. And obviously, that's what, not what I thought I was getting into politics for. But I had realized that if I was going to be in this unfamiliar profession, I would have to play it by the rules that had been established by decades of, of predecessors. So I forgot all the ethical principles um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Western democracies, and I started trying to do all of these. Hit or miss affair. Sometimes my request would reach a bureaucrat or official who for some reason still thought well of me, and he would make an effort to fulfill my request so my constituent would get the job or the transfer or whatever. And sometimes, quite rightly, uh, it would be ignored because, after all, why should perhaps an undeserving or a less deserving candidate be picked merely because um, uh, an influential MP has pushed their name? And these are amongst the dilemmas that I imagine the officials receiving my requests were faced with. Some decided one way, some decided the other. But this is the kind of stuff that needs to be done. We, I remember one, one case, somebody came with a totally fraudulent request, and I simply said, no, I cannot do this. And when the person left the room, my staff turned on me in horror, saying, no Kerala politician says no. You simply have to say yes to anything people ask. Do it with as much sincerity as you can muster, but you cannot say no. And the story that was told to me was of a Kerala chief minister whose constituent came to him demanding that he write a letter to President Bill Clinton um, saying that he must see the constituent. Now, if I had been in the, the recipient of such a request, I might have said, this is stupid, I'm not going to do it. Bill Clinton's going to think I'm an idiot for writing such a letter. But the chief minister of Kerala, who was a very famously populist politician, he knew that what Bill Clinton thought of him mattered far, far less than what his voter would think of him. So he wrote the letter. And I'm sure it never reached Bill Clinton, but he had consolidated the loyalty and the allegiance of that particular voter. So that was, uh, and this particular politician was also notorious for, um, uh, you could reach him at 2 a.m. to get somebody out of jail. You could uh, chase him into his bedroom to hand him a petition. And that's the kind of standard of, of democracy that Kerala politicians have got their voters accustomed to. Um, what were the other perils of an educated politician? I think they became even more apparent. I, I came back into government, as you all know, um, discovered um, that, that being a minister of state has considerable limitations. As I found myself tweeting one day, um, being an MOS is rather like standing in a cemetery. There are lots of people under you, but nobody's listening. Uh, and that essentially uh, summed up uh, my experience of ministerial office. I realized that there's very little you can do um, in situations where really all the authority is concentrated uh, in the cabinet minister. In the case of the foreign ministry, it was different because at least at the beginning, during my one year there, uh, allocations of responsibility were pretty clear. And so I was the de facto minister for Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, the Hajj, passports and visas, all of that came under me and the files stopped with me. Whereas um, I think after I left, even that ended and the ministers of state still had to, had to send that back up to the minister. And this again shows the limitations of our system. If you come in with a track record and experience in administration or diplomacy or whatever, and you think you can just transfer that seamlessly to a, a, a governmental environment where the rules are different, you've got another thing coming. Uh, but then, as I said, uh, uh, there were other lessons to be learned. We, we got into opposition in 2014. I survived my election uh, only because of that constituency work that I told you I was able to do. For example, there had been a, a national highway bypass that was meant to be built between Trivandrum and the Tamil Nadu border, uh, where the stones had been, marker stones had been laid on people's land 40 years previously. But for one reason or the other, 
the uh, project had, had not been able to be built. And these people were stuck because no one would buy their land, since people said your government's going to take over the land any minute now. Um, and, and they came to me saying, can you either get the damn project canceled and get these stones removed, or can you get the road built? And I thought the latter was a better idea, so I hassled uh, a number of, uh, of, of, of my colleagues in the UPA government, got the uh, road cleared, got it included in the, in the government's budget, and then with that, when that was done, ensured that the first checks to buy the, the land where the stones had been put down actually changed hands before the 2014 election. Otherwise, I was quite sure that the victors would claim all credit for having unbroke, uh, unblocked this logjam of the preceding 40 years. But anyway, so I did that, and, and th that's the kind of thing that helped me, helped me win the votes um, uh, of people. Uh, in, a, in a very tough election year, I was able to survive with a massively reduced majority, come into parliament, and then, of course, we were such, so depleted in numbers that the opportunity to speak in parliament and challenge the government became very important. And there, too, you could see some of the the, uh, the uh, conundrums that educated politicians faced. One was undoubtedly the fact that, um, that our system um, means that, and this is a system we've essentially copied from the British, and I do consider it a peculiar British perversion to elect a legislature in order to form an executive. Um, to my mind, that completely betrays the entire principle of separation of powers, uh, because say, unlike in the US, here, once you form the government with a majority in the, in the, in the parliament, or in the Lok Sabha at any rate, you essentially don't care anymore about whether what you are proposing makes sense, whether the laws you're writing are comprehensive and accurate, because whatever you propose, you have a brute majority that acts as a rubber stamp for you. And that I found immensely frustrating, because we would have these debates in which uh, the opposition would make very sensible and commonsensical suggestions. It wasn't just a question of policy preferences. But I'll give you one minor example. Uh, there was a bill which may have affected some of you, which actually had been initiated in the UPA days, but hadn't been submitted to Parliament, which the BJP brought. It was a bill that said that every, uh, inst every bank, uh, every, fin every firm, company, firm, factory, whatever, above a certain number of employees, had to provide in writing to all their employees a statement um, of their rights uh, as, as employees in that, in that, in that firm. And, and we all thought that was a good idea. There was no opposition to it. But I suggested that since so many people working, say, in factories in UP or Bihar or Orissa might actually not be terribly literate and not be able to understand the legal language, why not say that you should give it to them in writing and explain it orally? You can call all the factory workers on the floor and explain, we're giving you this paper, this is what your rights are, here you are. And I, while I was making the suggestion, I could see a majority of the BJP members nodding their heads in agreement, because it was clearly a common sense suggestion, wasn't violative or a disagreement of their policy. But sure enough, when the time came for the vote, needless to say, my amendment was shouted down on the grounds that the BJP had produced a bill, and that bill was going to go through whatever people said in Parliament. So that too becomes part of a, of a, uh, of a frustration for the average thinking politician. The other problem is that, in fact, uh, unlike, again, some Western democracies, we don't really write the laws. The laws are written by bureaucrats uh, uh, in the government. They're discussed in the cabinet and brought in. And except those bills which actually go through standing committees, where you can see a very detailed discussion by politicians on those committees of the provisions of the bill, the actual discussion on the floor of the House tends to have really no impact uh, on the bill. And that's, again terribly unfortunate. And finally, when it comes to things like um, the vote, thanks to the anti-defection law, no MP is able to vote his or her conscience. Um, let's say that, your, that, that a bill is brought for a vote. In our system, all parties seem to have the approach that once they decide how the vote should be, it's de facto a whip. With the result that there is no issue on which a, an MP is free to differ from the party line uh, and, and, and not vote as the party would wish. Because if they were to do that, they attract under the provisions of the Anti-Defection Act not only expulsion from their party, but expulsion from parliament itself. And after all the trouble and expense they've gone to to get elected to parliament, very, very few issues are going to prompt someone to stand up 
and, and risk losing his or her seat in order to take a position of principle on, on a stand that the party has, has, uh, has viewed differently. That's another one of the perils of being an educated politician. Uh, I, I was going on a bit too long, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of the range of all of these things. Um, we do tend to frown on innovation, uh, so that, for example, when I started uh, tweeting, that's something that the political class looked at quite askance. Actually, the story is a little more interesting. When I first started tweeting, I was unfortunately um, one of the very, very few public figures so doing. In fact, I still remember a little headline when I reached 10,000 followers. And, um, and, and um, uh, a number of very senior politicians, I won't name them, but people you've all heard of, very prominent people, said to me, hey, how do you get 10,000 followers? You know, any politician would kill for 10,000 an audience of 10,000, tell us what to do. And I was trying to explain Twitter and so on to them. But meanwhile, in those days, the media saw Twitter as a threat. They thought, why should we allow politicians to bypass us and go straight to the public? We need to bring this down. And so, as I said, every one of my tweets was attacked. And after the first two or three controversies, I think particularly after cat cattle class, at that point, all these people who asked me for help on Twitter kept far, far away. And, uh, and they, they, there was this, this widespread perception that um, even uh, uh, something called Twitter couldn't possibly be the right thing for a serious politician to do. Uh, when I tried to explain that you know, even Google and Yahoo are fairly silly words when you think about it, but no politician would think of doing without them, so why not Twitter because it's a way of reaching the public, um, they, there was stunned incomprehension. I gave an interview, which you can Google because it's on the record, in late 2009 to Harinder Baweja of Tehelka, saying that I was convinced that within 10 years, every major politician in India would be on Twitter. And as you all know, I didn't need to wait 10 years. Just five years later, Narendra Modi as prime minister was instructing every one of his cabinet to open a Twitter account. Uh, because you, you, you need to multiply your voice to the public, bypassing established channels. The media realized the wisdom of this early enough, and they too piled on, because for them too it became a way of amplifying their reach, promoting their stories, and, and indeed, um, indeed getting, um, getting uh, uh, shall we say, uh, their share of what the politicians are doing. I remember the late Arun Jaitley telling me that he no longer felt he had any need to call a press conference because if he wrote a blog, uh, which he became rather famous or notorious for doing, uh, both in opposition and in government, if he wrote a blog, it would be picked up by every media organization and his staff didn't have to make 75 phone calls to convene a conference. Everyone would see it anyway. And that then became... Uh, an approach of mutual interest to both the media and the politicians. Um, the other thing, finally, that, that we, we all suffer from in our political establishment is a complete lack of sense of humor. Um, I'm not sure that it's, it's... I'm sure that in private, these are the same people who are cracking dirty jokes and so on, or exchanging a wicked humor on WhatsApp messages to each other. But somehow there is a solemnity to public discourse. Uh, which is quite unworthy of, of Mahatma Gandhi, who was, as you know, famously and impishly uh, mischievous in his comments. You remember when he was asked by a, a British journalist, uh, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he replied, I think it would be a very good idea. Uh, or when he was upbraided for striding up the steps of Buckingham Palace in his dhoti, in his loincloth, to go and meet the king emperor, he smilingly replied, Oh, I think His Majesty had on enough clothes for the two of us. I mean, that kind of thing. Have you heard of an Indian politician saying things like that anymore? Um, it just doesn't happen. I, I, I scoured the works of Nehru for my biography on him, and it's his birthday today. A wonderful man, the greatest intellect to have ever been Prime Minister of India, and possibly one of the top five best political writers in the English language in the modern era. Um, but if you look at his works, his speeches, his writings... For humor, there's very, very little of it. I remember the one comment that I think was really sharp and witty um, was when he said uh, in America, uh, sort of with undisguised culture shock in 1949, he said, one must never visit America for the first time, <laughs> which I thought was, was rather clever. But in private, I'm told he was a very amusing dinner companion, charming, entertaining, would mimic people, was just a lot of fun, uh, got along with all sorts of people. 
But in public, we have this expectation that our politicians must be deadly serious. And I'm afraid that's something, that's a test I fail too often. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's time to now turn to what's on your mind, uh, just to say that I tried to give you a little bit of a taste of the different things that might constitute the perils of an educated politician. But one that I'm very happy to run the risk of is your asking questions that I might find difficult to answer. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, young lady. There's a hand up there in the middle of the room. Uh, two questions. Okay. And hopefully the first one is difficult. What's your favorite role, author or politician? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What's your favorite role, author or politician? I'm having real problems. What? Can you hear me? Your role as an author or politician? I oh, I see. Yeah, that's much clearer. Thank you. Sorry. For some reason, I, I just couldn't hear you the first time. Um, look, I mean, I'm a human being who has a number of reactions to the world I see around me, some of which I manifest through my writing, my comments, my columns, and so on, and some of which I manifest through my work, whether it was at the United Nations, where I worked uh, for refugees, I worked in, in resolving a number of international problems, I was in charge of the, the peacekeeping mess we had during the Yugoslav Civil War. Um, so. I've always felt it important to work in both the world of conclusions and the world of decisions, the world of reflection and the world of action, the world of thoughts and observations and the world of policy and engagement. I just found it impossible to give one up for the other. So one last comment is I'm a lawyer and I heard your comment that you know laws in this country are made by bureaucrats without lawyers' help. Except Don't, those that go through standing committees, yeah. and provided the standing committee's advice is and actually taken into account, yeah, which so it may not be. Yeah. Don't you think we need to change that? Of course we do. I mean, I, I honestly think that our system itself, some of you may know that for over 25 years I've been writing passionately about why the parliamentary system was completely the wrong choice uh, for our country, and it just doesn't reflect the way in which Indians vote, Indians behave. We actually vote for individuals, not for party programs, our parties themselves are really identical combinations of, of, of people with no real great coherent differences. I mean, the, the British invented this system to reflect their reality in a tiny island state where even today, after so many decades of population growth, a parliamentary constituency is one lakh people. It's just not uh, where you can actually interrelate with, you can truly represent them. And even then, their system gives the parliamentarian complete freedom. Uh, the famous principles enunciated by Edmund Burke in his uh, speech to the electors of Bristol, that once you elect me, I'm not obliged to you or to the party, I'm only obliged to use my best judgment to take the stands that I believe are right for you. And if you don't agree with me, vote me out. That is the principle. We don't follow that either. So we are now stuck in a position where we have the worst of all possible worlds, in my view. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for the US system. And my American friends say, you're crazy because our system is stuck in gridlock. And I said, that's because you guys only have two parties. We'll never have gridlock uh, with one president occupying, you know, uh, the, the, the White House there, local Yan Marg here, uh, from one party and, and the parliament dominated by another party, because in fact, in practice, people have put 303 BJP MPs in largely because they wanted Narendra Modi. If they could vote for Narendra Modi separately, and then vote for their local MPs that actually vote for somebody whom they knew and understood and, and could relate to and could actually represent their interests properly. And that would represent, even today, over 40 different parties in parliament. So the, the person elected to, as the chief executive of the country, call him president, would have to create issue-based coalitions. And these people would be elected to legislate, not to form the executive. Right now, no lawmaker is actually interested in making laws. They seek election in the hope of becoming members of the government. That, I think, is a very, very flawed system. Sir. Mr. Tharoor, uh, your talk was delightful as usual. Thank you, sir. We live in a post-truth world. What is the role of an educated politician in a post-truth world? Or is there well, a role I, 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 I don't buy this post-truth business. Honestly, post-truth is a, is a very sort of post-modernist way of saying lies. Right. I mean, post-truth means essentially that it's untruth. And once you go beyond truth, the only field left is that of dishonesty and lying, mendacity. And that's not something that I think we should encourage or whatever. So 
to my mind, if somebody says nonsense, nonsense or spend, you know, spins completely fake stories or puts out, puts out messages, which, um, as we all know, even in our own politics, we've seen too much of, which can politely be called as fake news, we should call it out. We should condemn it. We should say this is wrong. I mean, if we start, uh, you know, understanding or believing that there is a certain reality, which is what ordinary people experience, and a different reality, which is what governments and politicians project, then we are in for the high jump as a society and as a nation. I think we should reject all notions of post-truth. We should stand up with integrity, with conviction, with education, with knowledge, with principles and values, and say, this is what we're here for, and this is what we're trying to uh, stand up and do for the country. And you, if you don't like it, vote for someone else. But at least you know what you're doing, uh, what you're voting for. Instead, we have all of this um, reliance on the submissiveness of the media uh, and the um, forgetfulness of the public. So, you know, Mr. Modi will stand up and say, you know, give me 50 days, otherwise burn me alive. And no one's going to burn him alive. Um, and and that's when, that was when he made Demon a front page headline when it had failed comprehensively after 50 days, when the Reserve Bank of India had become known as the Reverse Bank of India for the number of notifications it issued changing the previous notifications. When all that happened, did anybody, even in the media, stand up and say, sorry, Mr. Modi, 50 days are up, here's the pile? No, because the fact is that you can say anything and get away with it in an atmosphere where you're not challenged very specifically and strongly. And that is something that, uh, it seems to me, we really do have to, have to worry about. So the only answer to post-truth is the truth itself. The only answer to unprincipled dishonesty is principles and integrity. Yeah. Good evening, sir. sir. Uh, good evening, so Indian sir. politics is largely uh, you know, uh, commanded by the mass-based leaders. So you could uh, connect very well with the classes. But did you find, uh, find it difficult to connect with the masses? Well, as you can see, I won again a third time, this time again by a lack of votes. So clearly I'm doing something right in connecting with the masses in my constituency. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir, at the back, uh, on your right-hand side. Yeah, whoever's got the mic, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I would like to ask uh, you three questions. Uh, how easy is it for you to work with, bureau uh, for, to work with bureaucracy? for you as an educated MP and the other MPs. And my next two questions are on a very lighter note. Uh, like the American Correspondents' Dinner, where we see the, uh, the politicians, uh, the educated politicians roasting each other. So can we see that in India? And third, on a very lighter note, where I saw your Amazon. Uh, just hold the just mic a little step closer step. to you. I'm not, I'm missing that. Sorry? Hold the mic a little closer to you. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my second question was like the American Correspondents' Dinner, where we see the educated politicians roasting each, e each other. So can we see that in India in the near future? And uh, sir, since I'm a fan of yours, uh, last question, has your Caesar salad arrived as yet? <laughs> That's a reference to the fact that I took the risk of agreeing to a, to a stand-up comedy act, uh, which was um, recorded uh, for Amazon Prime. I actually cracked jokes for 24 minutes, so, uh, and that too to a live audience in a Noida nightclub, and I would say 80%, 90% of that audience was under 30, so it, it took some nerves, but having done it, and it went very well, uh, I'm pleased that of the 24 minutes, they're broadcasting about 8 minutes, uh, I think uh, tomorrow, 15th night, I think, on Amazon Prime, um, and, you know, it's, it's, some degree of risk-taking and some degree of not, because ultimately everyone knows it's meant to be humor. I mean, you're not trying to use humor in a political context. You're standing up and doing stand-up comedy. It's got to be funny or at least attempt to be funny. And I've, I've tried to do that there. But coming back to the only thing, first on working with the bureaucracy, yes, it is much easier because I come from the same stock, as it were. I went to St. Stephen's College. Many of my classmates were bureaucrats. Uh, now, unfortunately, everybody has retired. We've become long in the tooth. But when I first came into politics uh, in my early 50s, I had the luxury that about 17, 18 of my contemporaries from Delhi University were secretaries to the government of India. And I was able to get a lot of favors done for my constituency that way as well. Uh, the chairman of the railway board, I'm so grateful to him because he, he got me uh, train stops that people had been agitating for 27 years, but he'd been my senior in college. So dealing with the bureaucracy when you come from a similar sort of background, when you could have been an, a bureaucrat yourself, is much easier 
for educated politicians, no question about that. Uh, on the same, and Mr. Modi, by the way, as you know, has now started appointing um, retired bureaucrats to the Rajya Sabha and getting them into ministerial office. Uh, and we've seen that with Hardeep Puri, who spoke to you today. We've seen it with Jay Shankar uh, in the last government with Alphonse. There have been a number of people, or all IAS, IFS, IPS as well, R.K. Singh, Suryavi Singh, etc., uh, who have served in ministerial office because Mr. Modi trusts bureaucrats more than he trusts uh, politicians to deliver on, on his commitment. So it's, it's, there is something to be said, again, for looking at how the system is supposed to function. We're supposed to have a clear watertight distinction between the permanent civil service on the one hand and the elected political class on the other. But the Rajya Sabha has now become under Mr. Modi a mechanism for bypassing that distinction. Um, and I don't blame him. Ability is important and his party doesn't have much of it. Uh, so he can bring it in from the, from the bureaucratic classes. But it is, it is a question about how our politics works. Uh, on, the, on the second thing about um, uh, the American White House Correspondents Association dinner, you will never see that in India. Uh, I mean, you remember the howls of outrage when AIB tried to do a roast. Movie stars roasting other movie stars, and that became controversial. Can you imagine, politicians, the things we'd say and the things we've done? Even in my 24 minutes uh, stand-up comedy act, I cracked a few political jokes. All of them have been left out of the eight-minute broadcast because even Amazon is scared that anyone, and these were just jokes that people, but is scared that joking about politics will not be taken well in the political establishment. So that is very much the, um, the mood in this country, I'm afraid it's not gonna happen. I think I'll have you one last question. I think somebody has the mic. Uh, so, so yeah. This side. Hello. Yeah. Good evening. Oh, sorry, there's a young girl as well. Hi. I think in terms of gender, I better go for her. Yes, go ahead. A little closer, please. Higher. You have been a very highly uh, visible politician in the era that we are in. Uh, there was a time when there have been personal attacks on you. I would like it's to still going know, on. Yeah, ongoing. So I would like to know from you what does it take for you to uh, sail through those tough times? And my second question is what will it take for Congress to come back? Oh, boy. The second question is actually easier to answer. It'll take you guys to vote for us and we'll come back. Um, now, let, let, me, let me come back to the first one because um, it really, it, it was extremely hard because I had nothing in my professional life had prepared me for the level of abuse, of criticism, of false accusations, of character assassination, everything that, that has taken place. Um, two bits of advice stayed, uh, helped me serve me in good stead. One was actually... Uh, from Mr. Natwar Singh, who of course subsequently himself left the Congress. But Natwar Singh told me of how when he left the Foreign Service to become a politician uh, at Mrs. Indira Gandhi's request, and she attended his swearing in, he was wearing a suit, a Western suit. So he very apologetically said to her, Madam, I'm going to get some bangala stitched. And she said, no, Natwar, in politics, you better just grow a thicker skin. And that, I thought, was a, a very good piece of advice. You need to be able to take a lot more than you would have to in, in normal civilian life. You need to be prepared for a lot more slings and arrows on your skin. The second piece of advice, paradoxically, came from Kofi Annan, uh, who himself was the victim of a lot of unfair attacks um, on the oil for food scheme and so on when he was at the United Nations. And he told me once something that I actually didn't understand when he told me. He said, my father has taught me an old Ghanaian proverb, when the sharks bite you, do not bleed. And I said, but if the sharks bite you, of course you bleed. Mean? He said, think about it, one day you'll understand the meaning. And it took me several years to actually be bitten by the sharks in India for me to understand the importance of not bleeding. Because what the sharks want is to see that blood in the water. And if you don't give them that satisfaction, they might eventually stop biting because they're not getting that blood anymore. And there's all the other principles we can talk about. Somebody was saying, oh, what grace under pressure, etc." Yeah, grace under pressure is one of these classic things that my generation was always brought up. Stiff upper lip, don't show your emotions, uh, be strong to the outside world, all of that. But all that apart, a very simple message, when the sharks bite you, do not bleed, is not a bad message to have. Uh, ultimately, deny the unfair attackers the satisfaction of savoring 
your own discomfort, misery, unhappiness, and so on. And therefore, I simply reacted to all of this by continuing doing my job, and in fact, doing more than my job, making speeches, writing books, uh, putting my point of view across. And I thought that was the best way to respond, because if I allowed them to define me, and I allowed them to crush me, then I was being untrue to myself, which is something I didn't want to be. Thank you all very much. You've been a great audience. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Okay, so before I let you go, I have one last question that I want you to answer. You've given us so much food for action and reflection. Leave us with the word of the day. Well, I actually just did this a few days ago on social media, which is a kid asked me precisely this question, a school kid. And I said, listen, there's only one word I'm going to give you, and it's not a long word, it's not a new word. It's read. Because I didn't acquire a vocabulary by mugging up dictionaries. I just read widely and extensively. I grew up in India without television, without computers, mobile phones, Nintendo, PlayStation. Books were my education, my entertainment, my escape. And frankly, if you read widely enough, you will acquire a great vocabulary. And, and if you come across the same word in three different places, three different contexts and usages, you'll understand very quickly what it means, how it's meant to be used. And that's essentially uh, how I've built up my vocabulary. And everybody in this room and their children at home can do exactly the same thing if they will take the time to read. Well, then I have four words. I promise to read. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shashi Tharu, once again. Thank, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Have a great rest of the evening. Thank you so much for joining.